Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, first, I uh, am happy to be among you, but it is good also to zoom in now to specific case studies because they can elucidate the, uh, the complexity of challenges facing Africa. And South Sudan is a microcosm of the uh, of site conflict in, in Africa. It's, a, it's quite a challenging, but I think it is very important. It's an area, I mean, it's a country that we can learn a lot of things from it, and so that we can avert what the lesson you can learn from South Sudan. And especially for the U.S. has invested massively in this country, and I will highlight some of these issues later on. Maybe the way I want to, it's a very complex situation, but I want just to highlight some few points in order to guide me while engaging with you. But the most part is just to for your questions, because these are going to be quite important. And I will assume, some of you are quite knowledgeable about South Sudan, but I assume also some of you may not be having a lot of knowledge about South Sudan, so I will be navigating between reconciling. If I become repetitive, then please apologize for that. But maybe the biggest question, why civil war? I know it's quite a basic, uh, but I want to use a different lens of how best we can see what is happening, because sometimes we can be good, caught up with certain lens with which we look at conflict in, in Africa or generally. And then I will discuss a very complicated one, the dynamic of regional politics and issue of subsidiarity and the mediation and the peace building and how it is a bit of a very bumpy process and I will highlight that one. And then the role of the United Nations and international actors in such a complex situation. And the lastly, what is the future? What does the future hold for South Sudan? Let me... Uh, Basic information about South Sudan, um, the newest country gained its independence in 2011, had a history of conflict. These are the people for their war, for dignity from the north, Islamic north. It's a failure of how to manage diversity in Africa that resulted into the independence of South Sudan. Uh, a clear case of how forging an ideology that you can you can you can you can put people in one in one ethnic group and one religion is not sustainable. Sudan failed to provide that opportunity of how they can nurture diversity as a source of wealth and and and, and nation and nation building. So this is a country. So that is country emerged from marginalization and, and, and got a lot of support from international community. But then the question, today South Sudan is the main exporters of refugees and displacement. Half of the population is either displaced or to refuge. 60% of the population is in, under the uh, facing famine or food insecurity. He's the most fragile country on the continent. And, uh, and in fact, we in the Africa Center, we have decided we use in our training fictitious simulation. <laughs> but we said this, <laughs> we decided to use actually the real, the real, the real stories, uh, real countries in order to, to test some of the things we are teaching, especially South Sudan becoming a good case. Uh, we, 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 we use it in Dakar when we're having a training on national security strategy development as a case study of how can you best you can use South Sudan as a case to get out from this fragility and, and conflict. But then we have two major ethnic groups, Dinka and Nuer. But I think this ethnic politics is very important also to zoom in and to see in, in the, the, the importance of this ethnicity and diversity. It's not that they are a problem by themselves, but are quite important in understanding the dynamics of conflict in, in Africa. Two major ethnic groups headed by two leaders. Uh, happen also the major ethnic group, Dinka, the majority, the, the, the president is from there, Sal Fakir, who is the current president, and then dubatized by vice president who happened to be the second largest. Um, so you could see about 64 ethnic groups, 
but virtually dominated by these two ethnic groups, uh, the Dinka and Nuer. But sometimes it's simplification of the conflict in South Sudan. The, uh, what happened, if we go for the real simple analysis, what happened, why civil war, a conflict erupted within the ruling party, the Sudan People's Liberation uh, Movement, over transformation and democratization of the political party, that resulted into a severe conflict and division within, and there was a power struggle within the, the ruling party. And because of that tension between the president and his vice president resulted into the conflict that we are seeing today. But I said this is very simplified way of looking at conflict. Maybe let me, I want to, 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 to widen this lens of, 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 of what happened in South Sudan. But I want to put it in a very general context. The, the, the state formation and nation building in Africa is still work in progress. And if this social contract is not structured properly, it will continue to pose a real challenge to Africa. Because the state themselves, maybe tomorrow I will be discussing about this issue of the, uh, the, the whole lot of gun class, in the, the, the class formation itself, and how, and, how, and how they manage to nurture the fragility within the state in Africa. So what happened, I use this lens of social contract as a way, so it is not about grievances, it is not about poverty, it is not, it is absence of a sincere and consensual contract between the citizen and the state, and between the citizen themselves. I will highlight a little on more on this. So what I did, I look at this, I become engaged in a very big project with the United Nations Development Fund about understanding the social contract. Well, how can we forge a, social, a sustainable social contract? And especially looking at the drivers of this sustainable social contract. And these three drivers are very important. And I will use in the context of South Sudan, a consensual agreement. An agreement that is, most of peace agreements they tend to be between the elites, and in most cases, the gun class, rewarding those who hold gun. So it's a power sharing between this class, but not citizens that assume to be the recipient of this legitimacy from this uh, power sharing arrangement. And the second one, and I think you mentioned it earlier, the issue of the uh, institutions, institutions that are inclusive and fair and then the last one about social cohesion, the trust. And I use this lens in order to understand what happened in South Sudan. What happened during the transition, South Sudan was dominated by these two ethnic groups. Before the war, during the transition period of six years, they were the one dominating. And when they were transitioning to the statehood, the ruling elites, especially the SPLM, monopolized the process. <coughs> in fact, before the independence of South Sudan, there was an agreement. And that agreement clearly defined the issue of how to manage diversity through a decentralized system and federalism. When they moved to the, uh, to the independence, they shifted to a very centralized system, I could say autocratic system. These are the people used to fight with Sudan for their dignity. And the moment they managed to, to get their estate, the constitutional making process was so bad, quite exclusive. And they abandoned what they have achieved during the, during the struggle before the year. So a, a clear example of how a transitional state, uh, um, constitutional making becoming a problem. And this is a good example. That, so, so the constitutional fragility of South Sudan was very clear at the independence. When you come to the institutions, and this is the point I would like to, to the, um, if you take the security sector, and I will echo it tomorrow, it was dominated by these two ethnic groups. 
almost about 60 percent from from the Dinka annual. And what happened? Most of the assistance and the and the development people focus at the center at the national level. And by doing so, we are actually accentuating and even strengthening the dominance of these two ethnic groups. While the periphery was left to be reached later on. So clear case how the institutions fail to forge and build a social contract in South Sudan. And the last one, the social cohesion and the trust. And imagine uh, we have a lot of a lot of legacy of the past that they have never been addressed. And the moment there's a war, then this will trigger these grievances and the unsettled uh, past. So that's the way I would like to 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 to, to talk about the issue of uh, what happened in South Sudan. Really, and I want uh, it's one of the things. It's not, but social contract for me is a good way of. Uh, I used to. Uh, core conflict issues in order to see to what level the, so the social contract making in South Sudan managed to address them. The issue of how to manage diversity and the issue of representation. In most cases, these are very big issues in, in Africa context because any process that fails to address a specific core conflict issues, it, it, tends to, it will tend to, to fail. Now, The, the mediation, but for the mediation in South Sudan, definitely the, this, this idea of subsidiarity is very important because African Union, those who are near to the problem are well situated to mediate because they know the problem. And indeed, the stability of South Sudan is very important for the, uh, for the neighboring countries. But let me give you the, the problem facing South Sudan. Two issues, there's a politics of water Nile and then the politics of oil. These are key issues actually shaping and even the leadership hegemony in the, in the region. Sudan, a clear, a clear case, independence of South Sudan, for them, they believe the independence of South Sudan was a Western agenda, and they wanted to make sure this project must fail. But Sudan, through Sudan, the oil of South Sudan passes through Sudan to the port Sudan. So equally, by the time they want instability in South Sudan, they have a vested interest in having stability also. I mean, undermining the government there. Ethiopia is a very, one of, one of the countries that is very providing leadership, but is also very worried because and uh, Eritrea, and I hope things are now changing, Eritrea to a certain degree wanted to destabilize Ethiopia by having its opposition group in South Sudan. And that's why Ethiopia also very worried of Uganda because of the dominance of Uganda in the affairs of South Sudan. And, that, and they have a very large communities of uh, ethnic group called Nuer, which is actually very near to the, uh, in, in Ethiopia and in South Sudan. Kenya has a very clear economic interest in the area. But definitely Kenya would be interesting in establishing South Sudan. Uganda is almost seeing Southern Sudan as its extension. Uh, people believe even Uganda is the one actually ruling South Sudan indirectly. And, and it's a, they, have a, they have a problem even wanting to undermine the mediation of the region, what is called IGAD, Inter Intergovernmental Authority on Development, because, and they, and they decide not to look into the mediation by IGAD. And they wanted to have a process of how best they can reunify the SPLM, the ruling party, because that is the interest of Uganda. So you could see clearly by having this mediation, by this, this region, you could see the problem. So I will, now what happened, the mediation for, there was a peace agreement was signed in 2015. It did not work. People went into war. And they, they want to revitalize it now. The process started in Addis Ababa. It failed. The party did not agree. So Uganda and Sudan, paradoxically, they're actually, they are, they're, for the first time for them to agree, 
on, on something because they have been rivalry in, among themselves. But they said, let us try it, Uganda and, and Sudan. So they took the mediation from Ethiopia with the acceptance of IGAD to Khartoum. And I think they finished the day for yesterday. But what happened in Khartoum, Khartoum decided before anything, before negotiating anything, they forced the parties to sign an agreement allowing Khartoum, allowing Sudan to come to southern Sudan and protect its oil fields. Because for them, that's a very big. Uh, and you could see people sign agreement under duress, and we got this information. And in actual fact, Sudan and Uganda, they agreed in this agreement, forced on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the parties, that they are the one going to help in transforming the security sector training. Well, the other countries are just watching them. How is it happening? So you could clearly see now they're going to sign an agreement that for some of us, we believe this agreement will not, will not, uh, will, will, will not succeed because it is, it, is, uh, it is imposed on the parties. This is how some of the cartoonists, <laughs> they, they, uh, they portray the mediation in, in, in South Sudan. That is the president of, of, uh, of Sudan, interesting in oil. <laughs> while the southern Sudanese are struggling for the share, I mean, for the power. And it's a very, it's a, it's a clear case of how, and it is indeed, this is what, what, what is happening in, in South Sudan. So it's a mediation, regional mediation may not be sufficient to provide a sustainable peace. And that's why people may need to think out of the box, especially in the context of, of South Sudan, is a good example how the vested interests of these countries can undermine the very peace that can be quite useful and beneficial to the parties. This is the level, somebody has been doing some work. Imagine before the mediation and after mediation, we have now not less than 40, 50, 45 armed groups all over South Sudan. Even somebody tried to map it, the mediation itself becoming, because everybody would like to be part of the year. Because if you fail the mediation, then you are encouraging more armed groups to come, to come in. So there's a very clear link between a bad mediation and the proliferation of the, of the arms group in, in, in the country. United Nations and, and international actors. <laughs> this is a journalist also portraying Almost a genocide, a famine, a very reckless government killing its own people. United Nations is having, uh, under chapter 7, almost 1,000 people got killed in Juba. We have not less than a quarter of a million in the protection uh, unit within the United Nations. And, and, and it is true, it is very difficult within the, the limits of what resources they have, but it's a very clear case how the humanitarian and then the international community is failing in South Sudan. Now we are receiving 1.7 billion humanitarian assistance, and, and, and people, even the aid workers, are being killed. So there's a need to revisit, I think there's a need to revisit the role of the, of the United Nations and the role of the, uh, of the peacekeeping. Yes, they are quite important, and even humanitarian assistance. And we know for sure how aid is still becoming part of the process of, of, of fighting war. So it's not aid by itself, but the way it is managed. I think there are a lot of questions to be raised about the issue of, uh, of the UN. Um, the, the aid itself and the international actors. Uh, but definitely, counterfactually, if we were not to have United Nations also in South Sudan, maybe we would have lost so many lives. So what other alternative do we have? I think it's more about how best we can do things differently to capitalize on huge resources available within the United Nations and in the, even the international uh, actors. And I want to echo one thing, even what is happening when you have a state itself becoming a problem. 
You have a problem, for example, the United Nations is one, I mean, the U U U U U U U U government is one of highly, the people, the citizens of South Sudan respect the United, I mean, the, the U U U U government because they invested for a longer period of time. The point you raised earlier, and this is investment, but the problem you have, a, you have a state between the good intentions of donors and the citizens. And it's very difficult for you to go through because becoming the gatekeeper is a big problem. That's why undermining, I mean, underrating the role that the donors are playing also, we should also think through which, which lens we are looking at because they state themselves becoming a barrier for the donors to, to have access to the citizen that really appreciate that one. So what, what, what does the future hold for South Sudan? Definitely there are two, three trajectories. One is the current status quo. Now they have signed peace agreement. The same two leaders, the, the current president, Selfa, and the same Rieg, the deputy, are coming back again to form a government of national unity. These are, these are the people they will not be able to work together. But it is being re renegotiated, revitalized, and they're coming back. For some of us, we believe this one is not going to be, is not going to be a sustainable peace at all. There's a possibility we go to this, this state of anarchy and lawlessness. And that is that seems to be what seeing it going to, to happen. So what is the pathway to, to stability in South Sudan? There are a lot of arguments. Some of us we have been arguing. If the state itself becoming a problem, we need to reconsider. We have been, some of us have been writing and we said, look, it would be good to have, to have an exit strategy for these two leaders, a package for them to exit. But it's difficult, but with that consent. But and form a, a, a technocratic government with the influence of the African Union and the uh, and the uh, and the and the United Nations. People may reject this 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 suggestion, but I have a feeling this may be one of the options need to be considered. But it should be African driven, and I think the the cost of war and the destabilization of South Sudan is quite enormous. And these are the, some of the thinking. And even if we, we believe, for example, security sector, well, if you have such a number of, 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 of militias, it is important that to outsource some country kind of Liberia, good example of whereby they manage to build the new security sector while they, they bring in foreign forces in order to, to keep the, the law and order. And the, uh, even the oil sector, with such a high level of corruption, it would be advisable to put a third party to manage these resources. Uh, and even the Bank of South Sudan, uh, possibility of using and a third party to, 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 to manage it. So I think it is a country that needed a lot of thinking out of the box and make sure that to restore hope to this country. Uh, thank you very much.